Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Poser. I will be the technical host today. I'm the outreach librarian for the NOAA Central Library. So with that, I will turn it over to Fiona Horsfall to introduce our uh, topic today and our presenters. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 10th fireside chat on research transitions. Unbelievable that it's been 10 so far. I am Fiona Horsfall, as Katie said. I'm the director of the Office of Research Transition and Application more commonly referred to as ORTA. And one of our roles is to provide transition support with the objective of accelerating transition, transitions across NOAA and simplifying the transitional process in general. Um, the goal of our series of fireside chats on research transitions is to provide participants with a broader understanding of research and development transition at NOAA. Um, I want to thank my staff for pulling this event together. Um, NOAA scientists collect significant volumes of data to meet mission requirements. So this specific fireside chat will investigate how data management and transitions of innovative technologies into operations go hand in hand to enable NOAA to meet its mission needs. I will moderate today's discussion. Um, and first, I would like to kick off this event by providing some um, background to set <clears throat> the stage for today's discussion. And so I'm going to ask Katie to move my slides through now. I, I asked, if we go back one, I asked for this one to be, um, can you go back one slide? Um, so you've collected the data and now what? Because a lot of people have data, lot, lots of great data, and they put it in their top drawer in a thumb drive. That's not helpful to anybody. So we want to make sure that this data is being carefully managed. So next slide. <clears throat> So um, I want to go back a step to talk about transition plans. So um, why do we have transition plans? And it was, in fact, on one of our fireside chats, maybe about two or three ago, that Ben Richards said that the best science is necessary, but not sufficient for successful transition. Um, so you can do all these great things, like I said, and with respect to data, you can put it in your top collected and then you put it in your top drawer. That's not helpful to anybody. So the purpose of a transition plan is to bring awareness of NOAA's R&D portfolio and how it furthers our mission, and also to lay out a roadmap for how you're planning to move forward with your research and development. And Dr. Spinrad has actually been in one of these fire, fireside chats with us to give the keynote. And um, he made a point of saying that it helps us understand our risks, and also it's extremely valuable for the budget process as well. So next slide. So um, just as a cautionary point, Transition plans are not cut and dry documents. They're living documents and they provide situational awareness of your work. They are not, you are not signing your life away when you sign a transition plan. Um, it does not represent a binding agreement or availability of funding, but it certainly lays out um, um, a vision, a roadmap, a direction, and it helps people understand what's going on and how they're gonna move forward. Next slide. Um, so we talk about readiness levels. Some of you may be familiar with NASA's technical readiness levels. We've adapted those in NOAA. And in fact, it's outlined in our NOAA administrative order on transitions. Um, that's being updated, by the way. But this is the roadmap. This is a clearer picture of the different readiness levels. And a transition plan basically walks you generally from RL4 all the way to your implementation piece. And so we found that this is a better, gives people a better understanding. Next, next slide. Um, data management plans. So this is what we're gonna talk about today, about data management in general. Um, I just wanna make a couple of points here, that they enable data sharing, and it also enables advanced planning for data storage and informed development of other information technology systems that I'm sure that the panelists will talk about today. It is also a living document. So nobody's signing their life away. Next slide, please. And um, both of uh, transition plans and data management plans are guided by NOAA administrative orders. So this is not something we're making up. This is something that NOAA has in place. And also the fact that data management plans and transition plans can be developed in parallel. Next slide, please. And that's the end of it. Um, we also, I just want to make a point that saying that on our website there listed at the bottom, we do have um, a feedback form, and we welcome you to go there and provide feedback, not only on our transition support function, but also on these fireside chats. So um, with that, <clears throat> I want to say that um, 
we will start with remarks from, from Deek Arn, uh, who is the director of the National Centers for Environmental Information, and follow with the conversations from our panelists for an in-depth look at how research transitions go hand in hand with data management. Um, we encourage you to ask questions through the chat box. Uh, questions will be sent to Katie Poser, who is our library host, um, to pose to the panelists in the second half of this event. Uh, if there's not enough time to answer all the questions, um, they will be answered directly via email. So we do keep those and we do respond to them. <clears throat> Just as a note, on the Auto website, like I mentioned, we have that feedback form. Uh, you can go, it's got questions also about these fireside chats. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome Deep Arn, who I have known for a very long time um, in one iteration or another. Um, he is the director, as I mentioned, of NCI, uh, which maintains many of the world's weather, <coughs> excuse me, ocean and geophysical observations, records and data sets, and is home to four International Science Council World Data Centers. And prior to becoming NCI director, Deke was the Climate Science and Services Division Chief, and prior to that, he headed NCI's climate monitoring team, which was responsible for providing the play-by-play -play of the climate system. We've all seen those um, information pieces that come out. Deke was recently the co-chair of the US Global Change Research Program Indicators Interagency Working Group, and currently serves on the Council of the American Meteorological Society. Uh, prior to joining NOAA, he served in several capacities at the Oklahoma Climate Climatological Survey, where I first met Deke, and uh, he's a graduate of the University of Oklahoma School of uh, Meteorology. So, Deke, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Fiona. It's great to see you again uh, as well. And I'm, I'm thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm really honored and thrilled to um, maybe set up for real pros in the field uh, to, to deliver remarks and insights. And looking forward to uh, learning myself. So, uh, yeah, I'm from NCEI. I'm one of the um, in your data management, your data may end up uh, in our hands as it begins um, what we used to call an active retirement, but I think increasingly is more of a second career for your data um, as it goes into inform uh, other scientists and other applications and and really kind of find its way into the nation's uh, uh, knowledge and uh, economy. So uh, one of the cool things, and I think that I'm super excited to hear about this is just in the last few years, NOAA has really embraced the, the, the role and the importance of data and to, say, to see the representation of this emerging network of data pros, uh, data offices and uh, points of excellence and points of contact across NOAA uh, is really neat. So, um, no, so I think so I think I don't know if I'm speaking for all of us. I, I might be. But uh, a lot of us in the data world kind of uh, come from some discipline and then sort of fall in love with data and the people uh, who do things uh, with it. So uh, that's certainly the case for me. Uh, being at NCI, it's really neat. One of the unique things we, we get to do is we do get to touch all of these or at least see and witness a lot of the great work that uh, researchers and, and the observing systems across NOAA are, are doing. Um, and we're you know, just to, this is the last of the NCEI commercial, but we're all fans of, of what you do. Uh, this is it. We're we're science nerds. We're data geeks, and um, we're we're always super impressed and thrilled by by what you do. So the, I, I'm very briefly. Uh, I know we we to get kind of get to the to the to the uh, the pros uh, on the call here. That just three kind of hopefully uh, reinforce three levels of motivation to to really tend to your data. Uh, you know, in your data management plan and just data uh, thinking in general. So one is 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 um, just just personal. Uh, you know, your personal ambition. It's good for you to take good care of your data to to um, craft a data management plan uh, as we uh, move into a knowledge economy where, um, in many cases, our data, the artifacts of our work. Uh, the inputs to our, uh, our our research move around faster uh, than even the concepts that that we develop in our in our research. Um, so one consequence in this kind of new data enlightenment, as data are running around the economy and the knowledge economy, um, having a DOI, having your authorship attached not only to your research work but to the data that you uh, produce or facilitate is going to be in your best interest, especially as we go forward and your data are combined with, with other data and reuse. So it, it, think of a data management plan 
as a second lane towards authorship recognition uh, to the to the extent that 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 means a lot to you. So, uh, you know, that that's one. Uh, I think a second motivation is, um, uh, you know, we're we're mostly in science or science informed worlds and uh, you know, it's it's a duty to our scientific disciplines, our our science community, our colleagues. Uh, repeatability is a huge, you know, that's a fu fundamental, foundational piece of the concept of science. And um, having a good data management plan facilitates the kind of repeatability that um, other scientists can take, can examine your results, can can incrementally advance. Um, our state of knowledge that folds back, of course, on the what's in it for for me uh, piece of it. That it, facilitating that sort of utility to the scientific community will come back in many ways uh, in a value for you personally as well, or, or, or your your own uh, career. I also think this is where Fiona mentioned several of the administrative orders. We have some regulatory uh, executive branch, the the PAR, the public access to research records. So that you know, we see a lot of um, what we'll call lowercase r regulatory um, pushes to to do better by our data, to be more conscious of how we think about our data. It is in the interest of uh, a, a better science-informed world to really be cognizant that, that your data is going to have a second career uh, beyond beyond uh, its inform informing uh, your work. And then finally, I think just in the 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 the, the third layer of, of motivation, I'll probably spend a little more time on in this than than the others, uh, is just the greater good, you know, service to uh, fellow citizens, humankind. Um, you know, your data will be used in ways that that you can't fathom. That uh, having been in the data business now for about 15 years directly, I you know, every month, every you know, I'm, I'm astonished at how people repurpose data and information in ways that I could not have imagined. And it's it's impressive and cool and really advances um, what we know about the world around us and what we can and how we can inform our relationships uh, with each other. Um, so uh, just know that your data will not only be aggregated with other data sets, you know, to to build a larger understanding of the earth uh, uh, from the, the piece that you've sampled uh, that, that that will definitely happen. But also, you know, you will see it used in ways. The, the things that you may see as noise or attenuation uh, in your data set will be someone else's signal. And, uh, you know, there's examples uh, across NOAA with it. I mean, just the stuff that we touch at NCEI. Uh, the attenuation that the folks uh, that are pinging the bottom of the, the ocean floor in bathymetry, you know, that stuff that gets in the way actually happens to be pretty important to the fisheries folks. So. Uh, uh, Bathy's noise is fishery signal and, and vice versa. Uh, as a meteorologist, I saw it so many times where uh, the radar information, where we were looking at hydrometeor targets, we were looking at uh, you know droplets and, and crystals and, and ice, uh, and never realized how much it would be used in ornithology and the study of bats and bugs. And uh, so the bird folks, the bat folks, the bug folks, you know, never in my uh, life when I think I'd be not only sitting in an ornithology conference, but actually um, participating in, in, in that kind of work. So I, this is again, the earth system that we share, it all is connected and the data that we leave behind in understanding parts of it is all connected. And, uh, and then finally, uh, you know, it, and again, kind of sorry to retreat back into my, my old kind of atmospheric climate world, but when you do write by your data and, and it is able to be put to kind of a, a larger or a broader use, um, you are improving things uh, that, that we know. So just two examples that I'm familiar with, you know, we, we have taken weather observations for a long, long time. Because of the care uh, of those types of observations, they have gone uh, from paper to telegraph to magnetic tape to, uh, disk to internet now to probably to cloud and those what we would either call media or IT transitions good data stewardship has allowed those to survive and so now um, an, an observation from Spokane Washington taken 82 years ago can be uh, helping to reinforce uh, what we know about our changing planet and that you know when combined with with similar 
observations taken in Poland or North Africa or the ocean and, or, or the ionosphere. And uh, it's just a, a, a great thing to do. And, and then finally, from a very personal level, again, retreating all the way back from this big picture stuff uh, and to describe the data that was taken 82 years ago in Spokane, Washington, what good data management practices can help do. Um, literally a, a case that my favorite moment at, so far at NCEI, uh, and I don't know if anyone uh, out there comes from a family with an adopted person, but if you're from a family with an adopted person, um, the early days, weeks, or years of one's life is kind of seen through a kaleidoscope in a fractured way. And uh, it's really important for an adopted person to, there, there's all, often a draw to really make sense of, the, of those first days. So my one of my favorite moments uh, was at NCEI when an 82 year old gentleman called us and said, hey, I just heard about you guys. And um, I was uh, adopted in, Spokane, I know where I was born, I know the day uh, I'm trying to put together, I don't have a lot of time, it was 82 years ago, I don't have a lot of time left, I'm really trying to put that together. And uh, the the through good data management from people that have long since passed, uh, we were able to reunite uh, a gentleman that was born uh, in, in, in a place and a time with data that were born at, in the same place and the same time. And they spent 82 years waiting to be reunited with each other. But that, that data really helped him uh, fill out some of the contours of his life in a very important way. And data are the residue of the, the work that we do. And they, I, 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 don't, I can't emphasize enough how important your data may become in, in ways that, uh, that we may not be thinking of. And with that, uh, uh, I, I'm really looking forward. Uh, I, I admire and look up to all four of the pros on the call here and looking forward to our conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dean. That's um, actually quite fascinating, especially <clears throat> the connection to um, the history of the adopted person and also um, the bat piece, because I know I read recently that bats swarm and, and they do cause a signal as well. So that's very, very curious. So thank you. So um, this time I'm happy to introduce the rest of the panelists on the screen here. Um, Nori Shoji is a senior strategist to the director of the Office of Science and Technology and the assistant chief data officer in the National Marine Fisheries Service. Monica Youngman is the chief of the NCEI data stewardship division and the alternate ACD, ACDO, that's a handful, uh, for NESDIS. And Me Megan Cromwell is the assistant chief data officer for the National Ocean Service, sitting in the Information Management Office. And Jennifer Bowers is the Uncrewed Systems Data Coordinator in the Coasts, Oceans, and Geophysics Science Division of NCEI. So let, without <clears throat> further ado, let's get started on our question. So the first question is, what is data management and why is it important to meet NOAA's mission? And I'm gonna ask Mon Monica to kick us off with that. Great. Thank you for this first question. And I hope to you know, kind of demystify this, you know, data management is some, some big scary thing out there that, that we all are talking about. So what is it fundamentally? It's, it's the practice of collecting, organizing, accessing, and then using data to support productivity, efficiency, and decision making. We do this every day without even thinking about it. So you take your email as a primary example. Yeah. It comes in with some metadata, who sent it, when was it sent, you know, what's the subject, and then maybe you tag it or you put it in folders and you're adding that metadata to the email. Why do you do that? So you can find it later, so you can use it and you can reuse it into the future. So we do this without thinking about it in our everyday life. Um, and that that's what we're talking about doing with our scientific data. Now, if you think about your email again, do you ever later go back and come up with a much better organization method and, and wish you could just start over <laughs> so that it would all fit that? You know, that sort of planning is what we're talking about with data management plans. Um, so with data management, we tend to use a fair uh, data principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable really to drive the data management practices. So if we go back to the email example, you know, how well can you find uh, a previous email and can you get to it? Maybe you have multiple email platforms and, and do they work together um, so you can find emails across platforms? 
And then finally, tomorrow, one year, 10 years from now, can you still find that email and go back and understand and reuse the information there? And so data management really happens from the moment you start thinking about collecting or using any type of data. And I really recommend that the earlier in your research um, that you start thinking about data management and have an understanding of where you want to be when you are going into a research transition, um, the easier it will be for you. Uh, it'll be less work, you know, and you'll be able to have a more robust structure rather than trying to go back through your thousands, hundreds of thousands of emails and trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so, so I hope that really helps describe what data management is. Why is data management important? Um, as Fiona said, it's really critical for planning and coordination across NOAA to ensure resources are, are available and that you can leverage existing capabilities. We don't want people having to reinvent the wheel, you know, and doing more work and, and expending more resources than necessary. And then, um, as Deke mentioned, I think there's, for the scientific community especially, there, there's really three different levels of that. The personal level of um, getting credit for your work. Um, and I just want to foot stamp what Deke said there is that data is becoming the currency of the future. And being able to have a, a digital object identifier, a DOI for your data set, being able to have that cited, that is going to be extremely valuable um, as a scientist moving into the future. For the scientific community, reproducibility, ensuring that we ha have that robust scientific knowledge. Um, and it also allows for the community to find data um, and have that equitable discovery um, to really break down the barriers of, of the system where it, it matters who you know and do you know which system to go to to find the data and access it um, so that we can all advance our scientific body of knowledge and, and really make a difference into the future. And, and then finally, um, just the, the future of the reuse of data in ways that we never uh, would think would be possible. And I've seen this firsthand um, in the NCI physical archives um, as one example. We have an archive of all the pre-computer satellite imagery. And when they were collected, people knew they were valuable data. They didn't know why necessarily or what they would be used for. And today, there's a lot of interest in those images, uh, in the scientific research from climate to Arctic studies, severe storms, and many other fields. So it is really powerful um, that your research today can fuel in, and be the foundation for scientific advancements far into the future. Great, thank you, Monica. It's an interesting way to approach things. I like the email reference because <clears throat> that's how I manage mine. Um, so does anybody else, would anybody else like to chime in or add a comment there? Otherwise we can move to the next question. Um, what does, what goes into a data management plan and who is responsible for developing it? Are there templates for data management plans and where can you find an example of a data management plan? So I'm going to hand it over to Megan. Megan, would you like to take this one? Sure. So I will start with what goes into a data management plan. The short answer is pretty much everything. Um, the longer answer is let's let's think about the goals. What is the purpose of a plan? And it's to ensure that everyone has common expectations and an understanding of how to coordinate data collection. The entire plan from, as Monica said, prior to collection, through collection, through products, through making it available. Um, we want to make sure that we have proper documentation for metadata. We want to have make sure that it's Excel accessible and preserved for use. And the important part to keep in mind is that it is a living document, just like transition plans. They can they can be created in coordination. Reality is there's a whole lot of overlap. So if you do them together, you're probably going to save yourself time and money down the road. I was a bookkeeper before I was a scientist. Um, and then when it comes to who is responsible for developing it, honestly, the responsibility lies with everyone from the people funding a project to the project manager to program managers to each individual collecting the data. Everyone should have the input. If something changes, the person collecting the data needs to go back and change it. If a process to create a product changes, we need to go back and update that data management plan. But reality is, is that we all need them 
and we all bear some level of responsibility for it. Um, and lastly, we do have templates for the data management plan. We, the NOAA administrative order 212-15B, I think was signed, which is going to institute the handbook. The handbook has an appendix C, I believe, that is an excellent example of a template. Granted, we could all build on those. There are things that we may want to add that may not be included there, such as estimated volumes, so we can help IT do planning, so we can help the archives do planning for what their storage is gonna need to be in a few years when we move the data over. But again, I go back to the initial thought that we all bear some responsibility and a data management plan is a really useful tool. We are in a transition period, so there is a little bit more flexibility, but we all still have common goals in where we're going with this. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, would anybody else like to chime in on that? Okay, so let's move ahead to the next question. Does NOAA require each project to have a data management plan? And I think that's kind of sort of been covered, but um, and do line offices have their own requirements for data management? Um, so, Jen, I'd like to ask you to kick off that question. Okay, happy to do that. Um, yes, but it's complicated. Um, everybody, there, there needs to be a data management plan for, for data that is collected at, at NOAA. Um, it's not as linear as everybody's going to have to run out and generate a, a data management plan quickly because we can reuse data management plans that are in existence. Um, we also have uh, umbrella data management plans that cover some of the large uh, collection programs. Um, when you're talking about mature data flows, operational data flows, there are submission agreements and service level agreements that are in place that describe those data flows and they can certainly serve as a large part of, of those, those data management plans. Um, a good example is a lot of folks collect glider data. It's a very common um, device that is, is used to, to monitor temperature and salinity in the ocean. Um, that data is collected by partners across the, the university and, and really, I mean, anywhere, even oil industry is, is collecting that kind of data these days. But uh, that data can be fed into the, that I use glider DAC. Um, and when that data makes its way to the, the glider DAC, um, it can be released to, to be used for forecasting applications. Uh, if our weather services can tap that data stream and use that, it's, it's understood, it's known, it's part of the, the glider DAC's uh, data management plan. Um, and in addition to that, when you do put your, your data in the, the glider DAC, you make it available for retrospective product generation. So looking back uh, across time, generating better models for, for the weather forecasting applications. Um, ocean heat content is something that we do here at, at NCEI. We have an ocean climate lab. And uh, Tim Boyer and his team love to receive any of your data uh, with regard to temperature, salinity, depth, and, and location uh, to kind of monitor what's going on uh, with the long-term climate. So right, yes, data management planning is, is necessary. Reusing data management plans where practicable is best practice for sure. Um, and if anybody needs help with, with data management planning, I think anybody from this panel is able to help. And for anybody with uncrewed systems, uh, Jennifer.Bowers, <laughs> hit me up. I'm always here. I'm always here and ready to help. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, Nori, do you want to go with that? Sure, I, I, I think both Megan and Jennifer have covered it pretty thoroughly. What I like to think of is more of those umbrella data management plans. I think we can nest many things under an umbrella plan and it sort of bleeds into what will be your next question. But, you know, thinking about whether you do a project level or you do a program level is an important conversation to have because at least in fisheries, you know, we're not doing a lot of, um, research for research sake. We're doing applied research for a specific reason. And so that cover is a, a good chunk of what we do under a data management plan that sits at a program level. And then multiple PIs are using that same structure because ultimately what, what we need the plan for is to get at those, how much data, where does it sit? 
how are you moving it through? How are you ensuring you're moving towards the ultimate archive and those sorts of things? So it's information that's being shared outside of your immediate um, team, but it informs so much of the funding needs of the future as well, especially when we start talking about these new data streams coming in that are you know, terabytes a day. That's a lot to have to manage. And so having a plan that you can modify as things change, it becomes really important to justifying budget and acquisitions and all of those sorts of things. Uh, thanks, Sarah. And I saw Megan put up her finger. So I just wanted to add that that check with your ACDOs too, um, because that's what we're here in service to each of our program offices is to help you figure out what you need and how to get there. Because like Nori said, there is nuance where it may, may be best to do an umbrella print plan or to break it down individually, depending on what the needs are. And we understand that each of our programs and each line office in general is gonna have different needs. And we wanna work with you and be flexible to work with what, what's best without creating a ton of extra work, but to still meet the needs and requirements. And, and Monica, go ahead. Yeah, so you got a good question here. Everyone's jumping in. Um, so just to add to what every, everyone's already said, um, we've had many discussions within NESDIS about the level of data management plans and what's the appropriate level, and, and there's no one right answer. Um, I think it is really important to consider the data, the project, and making sure that if there is an umbrella plan that everyone, every project that is with, under that umbrella is fully aware of that and, and is able to follow that. And, and if there need to be nuances, then either build that into the umbrella plan or, or makes like, you know, um, like child data management plans or, or do it that way. Um, the one thing I'll also highlight though is by doing a data management plan, you also start the process on your collection metadata record. And so, well, technically we're trying to link these into the future um, by filling out a data management plan, you can reuse that into collection metadata. So it's it's not just for the data management plan, it can help you um, down the road as well. So that may inform the level at which you want your data management plan to be at. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dean. Um, I'm, I'm gonna ask another question. Uh, okay, go ahead, Nora, uh, go ahead. Mostly ask your question because it, I think it feeds into that as well. Okay, I'm gonna ask this question to you then, Nori, how's that? So the next question is, um, Noah recommends transition plans for projects that intend to move beyond readiness level four, and I showed you that roadway initially. Um, what is the relationship between transition and data management planning? And at what point is the data management plan required? So Nori, I'll hand this over to you. Okay, so I'm gonna start from a fisheries perspective. Um, Deke mentioned little r, I'll mention big r. So much of what fisheries research goes towards is regulatory decisions by the management side of the house or the reg side of the house as we refer to it. So from a fisheries perspective, the very first thing you do is sort of map out your data management plan before you even think about your research plan. So it's almost step one. We know we're gonna collect data. So what's our plan gonna look like? Not in any sort of formal way. And this is where the ACDOs are negotiating what constitutes a data management plan to, to what level of um, completion. And so from a fisheries perspective, we're phasing it. The very initial thought, think about what kind of data you're collecting, where you think you're gonna pull it while you're still collecting, where will it live while you're processing, and then ultimately where do you hope the data is going to go? Because not all fisheries data fits within the NCEI model. We have to identify where it might reside in the future. So it's almost the very first thing we ask for. And then along with that is sort of any metadata records that might be generated. Because most of what we collect is not brand new to the type of data we have. So it's probably building off of a, a new technology, collecting a like data, so we have things we can build off of. From a transition, from a data management plan to transition, the one thing that's really important, I think, from a community perspective is we're going towards these big data, multi-line offices feeding in. So having a data management plan that clearly articulates roles and responsibilities across line offices and across programs becomes even more important early because once you're ready to transition, 
you want to ensure you have all the right people and the right subject matter experts sharing the information to the other side that's going to receive it. So if you're in a research um, program, but you're transitioning to operations program, there has to be a clean handoff. And that data management plan is really going to help the transition planning for that. So I think it's really important to think about the group effort side of it, because we are going towards this model and crude systems are an example, omics or another. These are NOAA level projects with multiple PIs and you want to ensure that everybody's moving forward together. And I actually think omics is a great example of how the community has put data management first in many respects, mostly because they're just trying to understand the differences of the omics collections across all of the various um, teams. Um, but they're also uh, very nice about pointing out how few tools NOAA has provided to do it well. So that gets back to what Megan was saying. You know, this is, we're learning as we go. The ACDOs as a community are fairly new. We're actually trying to not have differences as much as possible across the line offices, but agree to a common NOAA standard that we all support versus trying to, um, you know, plan big and then put the nuance in that's specific because ultimately the more you provide, the better your plans are. So um, if we are talking about differences, the difference between Megan and I in our conversations has more to do with phasing. Like I'm all for phasing. She's all for let's have as much information as possible, but I'm trying to keep the scientists in fisheries at a comfort level where they're not feeling like they're not doing science, all they're doing is data management. So trying to balance that out. Um, and that that's the nuance difference. Ultimately, we actually need the same amount of information in the data management plans, whether it's NOS, NESDIS, fisheries. Like that's, that's just how we get to it is where the nuance differences are, not what the requirement is. So I was just gonna say, Nori, that you, know, you made a very good point that things are evolving um, and technology is evolving and also data is evolving. And I certainly recognize that something like omics coming in introduces a whole new idea, all new ideas. I mean, I just think about, you know, just making it more relevant to, to people. You think about the ancestry or the, whatever it is, the DNA analysis, that's gotta be a huge database. And the omics is kind of approaching um, that level. And um, that's something that I never even thought about prior to three or four years ago. And I know that, you know, things will change. And in the rest of my career, I know things will change again, as it will for all of you. So it's great that we have the ACDOs now. Um, okay, I want to just ask uh, Jen, um, did you want to add something to that? And then we'll go to Megan. Yeah, I do. Um, I, as Monica stated, the best time to think about data management planning is when you're starting to think about what you're going to do in the first place. And Nori had just told us that that's um, just that's standard procedure for fisheries. Uh, they start data management before they even start thinking about the transition sometimes. There's a very organic alignment between transition planning and data management planning. They go hand in hand. Um, Readiness level four is about the time when you start thinking about dropping these things in the water. That's really when you need to initiate the data management plan if you haven't done so already. Um, that, that would be my recommendation, but we'd like to see them when I when I worked with um, Ken Vieira and, and Brian Cole from your office, Fiona. We really like to see them a little more holistically uh, approached at readiness level by five and six. We need to know who you are, what you're doing, the file formats you're bringing in. You don't have to have it completely filled out when you're working with a, a transitioning capability um, because sometimes you don't know. It's the file types can change on you, especially with, with uncrewed systems. They can, when there's a firmware update, your file handling changes, right? So it creates a, a cascading series of issues. Um, data management plans are living documents as are transition plans. So if you make, you know, if you, if you suggest something may happen and you find out it didn't work out that way, no problem, backspace, erase, refill and, and move it forward. It, it's not that big of a deal. 
Um, I think it's worthwhile to every scientist when they start transition planning and data management planning kind of together. Um, just get them rolling, get it documented, what's gonna happen two weeks, three weeks, a month down the line when you start putting your assets in the, the water or flying them in the air, so things are gonna go wrong, right? The technology is gonna start to have problems and you're gonna become overwhelmed with the, you know, the, the optical filters, the acoustic frequencies, all of the problems that, that hit the scientists um, that might detra detract you from completing uh, the, the metadata requirements and things like that of, of a uh, data management plan. But I also want to put in a plug that my, my favorite thing about doing your transition planning and data management planning together, they're both requirements of NOAA, is it starts the documentation process that you own your work, right? You haven't even got the paper done, but your name is already tied out there. It's known to NOAA that this is what's happening. If there are any kind of legal problems or something that, that materialize, you've already evidenced your work with a data management plan and a, a transition plan. So that's really great. And you can also, um, when you start a data management plan, you initiate a lot of those um, activities that are unknown to you that, that Deke was talking about earlier, right? I'm taking temperature measurements and it's gonna end up in a climate product, totally unknown to me, because the data management plan creates vis visibility across the NOAA data community. And I think that's great. I personally have used the data management plans that were produced from uncrewed systems with the Fry and Coles office to put requirements into our cloud architecture builds. So we're developing cloud architecture over at NSDES. Um, at NCEI, we are planning for capacity for the archive. So that's in terms of personnel and IT procurement. So, you know, Monica's group leads that, but I take that information out of the data management plans and I bring that to her team members that are doing those activities. You can't see that, it's, it's obscured to you, but the one thing everybody asks for is make it transparent to me. If you put it in the data management plan, I can make it transparent for you. <laughs> it's just gotta be out there, so thank you. So that's, that's actually in parallel with what Dr. Spinnerad has said is that um, for transition plans specifically, that they are very valuable tools in the budgetary process. So, um, Megan, I know that you had your finger up too. I, I just wanted to follow on with what Nori said a little bit, which is that all the ACDOs, all the line offices, all of NOAA, we do have the same end goal to get to the same level of documentation. We do have slightly different paths because we're starting from different places, but it reminded me to throw in the plug for grantees. So we haven't necessarily touched on grantees here, but it's covered under the handbook. They need to have data management plans. Um, there's even grant language guidance in the handbook. So if you deal with grantees, please make sure that you stay aware. This is also a requirement, not just for NOAA, but for NOAA funded data and partner programs and things of that nature. Wow, that's a very interesting point. I don't think a lot of people know that. So, um, all right, um, anybody else would like to address that? Okay, so um, thank you for all your responses so far. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to hand it over to Katie to see if we have any questions from the audience. Thank you, Fiona. We do have uh, questions, but the first one I wanted to say is, can you repeat the last point that was just uh, spoken? If anyone okay. remembers. <laughs> oh, about the grantees, was that the point? Uh, yes, I believe so. All right, Megan. So NOAA funded grantees are covered by NOAA mandates at this point in time. And one of those mandates is that we have a data management plan. We Another mandate, for example, is that we put publications in the institutional repository. And so it's, I think there's been a disconnect over time as far as the awareness of which policies apply to grantees. And so I encourage you to kind of reinvestigate that or talk to your ACDOs now because the handbook that's rolling out, it gives more specific guidance. But one of them is that they need to have a data management plan that includes all of the information, the same information that we do as a NOAA federal collect data collector or something of that nature. Nori, you want to add to that? I will add that 
there'll be checks and balances on this as well in the the grants agreements there will be language even in contracts there'll be language this is all forthcoming um i think in the grant language is already in place it's just not re well recognized because it's sort of can language and so that's what megan's really saying is really look because you already have the requirement within the grants agreements and now it's more about ensuring that we're, we're all aware for Can cooperative I... institute employees it's a little bit easier but there's a lot of other grant mechanisms that may not be as aware that's so I want to just follow up on that because uh, for transition plans um, while in many cases cooperative institute employees work on a particular project there has to be a NOAA PI or point of contact who actually does the signatures because people external to NOAA cannot sign a transition plan. As you know, we, the transition plans, they go through a signatory process. So is that does that apply to data management plans as well? So I can, I don't know that we've specifically gotten to that level of clarity, but uh, generally speaking, a cooperative, cooperative institute um, subject matter expert probably is much more involved in a data management plan, but ultimately it's, the federal side of that team that's responsible for ensuring that it's signed and it's where it's supposed to be and that there are the follow-ups for all of the things within the plan. So they're involved, but they're not responsible for ensuring that it meets the compliance. And so I just another point that we add to transition plans is um, if there is an external entity that is working on the project or is would be an end user for the project, we actually get letters of support from them that we kind of attach to the transition plan. And, and the reason is that the lawyers have told us there's no legally binding um, agreement there with any external person, and this is basically a NOAA document. So thanks for that. Does anybody um, have any follow-up comments on that? Okay, I'm gonna turn it back to Katie for um, next question. Uh, yes, we did have some follow-up questions about that, uh, about grants specifically. So there was one asking, does AGO have that language for grants standardized and available for grants? And it seemed like the answer is yes. Okay, awesome. And then there was a, a follow-up question saying... Uh, Katie, let's um, yep. comment on that. Go ahead. So I just wanted to add that there is language there. Um, sometimes it's nuanced based on program offices. And so the program office or the person, the group who's putting out the grant still needs to make sure that that language is included. It's, it's a double check and balance, if you will. It's not gonna automatically necessarily be there every time because there's nuances when you go from federally funded opportunities versus collaborative institutes versus other things, that language is gonna change. So just, I urge you to do due diligence on it. I'll pass it to Monica now. Yeah, and I just gonna highlight the data management handbook. Um, that is is where that language is. So it's it's transparent for anyone to see. Um, and in that, that handbook, there's a whole section on data management planning that describes um, data management plans and, and gives a lot of guidance. Um, so I just draw everyone's attention to that as well, um, because between that handbook and your ACDO, um, there's, there's a lot of resources um, to support you. Great, thank you. Katie, I'm handing it back to you now. Okay, let's switch gears. So this question came in early on. Who is responsible for making data accessible and understandable to non-scientists such as emergency managers, decision makers, etc.? Who wants to take that one on? Deke. Sure, ha uh, happy to. So that is where the that's where you know we're talking about transitions and and as we go from kind of science and into service and stewardship, our service offices typically have the communities or the constituents um, that they see eyeball to eyeball and are a huge part, you know, so not just in the research to ops transition, but from the ops back to the data services, um, communication within NOAA, uh, profoundly important because uh, our, our kind of forward facing service offices, service lines uh, are really an important piece of, of helping put NOAA's information into the dialect of the users that they value most. 
Okay, does anybody else? Uh, Monica, go ahead. Yeah, I'll add on to that. Um, and I think there's a question here of, of like, I guess I'm reading into the question a little bit, so I apologize if I'm taking this in a direction the, the person asked the question didn't intend, but um, part of it I think is, is a question of, okay, I'm in a scientific field, you know, what is my personal responsibility to make, you know, my data understandable to the general public, to emergency man managers? And, I, you know, it's going to be different for every data set and community. Um, in general, though, I'd say it's really important for the, the PI, for the scientists, to be able to document your data in a way that at least someone in a scientific field that's different from yours can understand and that can reuse your data. Um, I don't think there is a, a requirement or a need to make it, you know, 100% understandable by anyone in the public who's able to pick it up. <laughs> you know, that, that would be a really heavy lift. Um, but I, I think it is important to make your data understandable and reusable beyond like any a specific scientific discipline. I'm curious if anybody else has thoughts on that too. Uh, I just want to make a comment here that um, Megan uh, was dropped. Um, she's having internet issues, but she will join us again in a moment. So Nori, did you want to make a comment on that? Yes, I think um, the baseline is what Monica said. I think we have parts of NOAA that are more product service driven, um, and Megan could speak to a lot of that because many of them sit in NOS, but from a fisheries perspective, you know, we have offices like the Office of Habitat Conservation that really is well embedded into communities and working at that level and identifying what is value, finding how it is a value and and not, it doesn't remove the primary um, scientist who collected it because they're still, that's who they'll go to to ask questions, but it, it doesn't mean that scientist has to respond to everybody who has an interest in the data either. So it provides some leeway. Um, and I'll say as we're moving towards this sort of AI ML ready world, people are becoming much more savvy. They, they want to know how they're going to ingest the data. Even citizen scientists are looking at that aspect of it. So I think that um, the metadata becomes really important because that's where you really describe how well, how to use the data well and where it may not fit as well. So you're sort of putting the parameters on it and letting people choose how they're going to utilize the data, being very clear in your metadata records that your confidence levels decrease when you start utilizing this data in, in ways that it wasn't meant for because of the way it was collected and documented. And it's sort of that nuanced balance. Um, but I also think this is also the great opportunity for the sort of the, the research side to talk to the the management side that is really that interface that would address those um, community specific needs and that's um, the exciting part i think of the the coming together of research and management and making value add products and services oh jen i couldn't have said it better so i won't continue on that path i will only say the secret sauce to unlocking the reusability of data and routing data to uh, public applications or highly advanced science applications that we don't understand is the metadata. Metadata and file standards. It's very important um, at NCEI Uncrewed Systems, we're working with the US Navy METOC contingency to um, formalize NOAA Navy metadata standards for uncrewed systems. Uh, we reach out to the communities of practice, including the glider communities. We'll be working with um, the acoustic systems shortly. Uh, we work with uh, some folks over at NOS, uh, Tim Batista and, and his guys, um, to do some of that, the BAPI pipelines for the, the SAS data. But it's it's very important, and it's a multiplayer game. So everybody uh, jump in and, and participate. Metadata is not as scary when you realize what it can do for you. Um, so I, I just want to ask, uh, Katie, can you read that question again, only so that Megan may want an opportunity to respond? Because uh, Megan, when you were not here, somebody called out your name. <laughs> and so, yeah, Nori did, yeah. So, Katie, of can course. You 
Uh, who is responsible for making data accessible and understandable to non-scientists, such as emergency managers, decision makers, et cetera? So I'll keep this short and sweet. Um, I apologize, I'm having internet connection issues because it's storming. Um, I would, I go back to we all bear some level of responsibility, whether we're the ones actually doing it or not. Um, I think that when it comes down to actual decision makers and policy makers and things of that nature, in most cases, we already kind of know who's gonna be delivering that information. But I would say if we all bear some level to make it as understandable as possible using good metadata to try to use common formats to make AI ready data whenever possible, because that's gonna be one of our data management solutions moving forward. It's how we're gonna deal with big the ever growing amounts of data that we're getting. So I will leave it at that because I'm not sure what else was already said, but that's my take on it. All right, Megan, I certainly understand your issues with um, um, internet today. Um, I just want to say that we're approaching the top of the hour. We do have this scheduled to go on for another 15 minutes. So we're going to go ahead um, with more questions from the audience. Um, uh, Katie, do you want to give us the next one? Yes. Uh, can a data management plan for a project come from a contractor? Uh, this person has a variety of projects and data and data sources that do not seem to have a data management plan or documentation of how they were collected or stored. Could we recommend one? Who wants to take that one on? <laughs> uh, Megan, go ahead. I guess I'll volunteer, but I might volunteer Nori after me because this is something that she and I have, have been discussing on this side. And yes, um, if data are federally funded, they need a data management plan is the short answer. The longer answer is that we also should even work with partners, external partners like states and, and local governments to recommend and share guidance to strongly encourage projects that we participate in, even if we're not fully funding them. But for contractors, yes, contractors can make data management plans. And if it's NOAA data, it needs a data management plan. Again, I'm oversimplifying, so I'm gonna let Nori jump in and correct me. No, I think that covers it. I, Megan and I have been um, working with the Deepwater Horizon community because that is one of the areas where they did a lot of work and it was a lot of local state contract, a variety of things. and and the recognizing the importance of trying to shore up their data management plans, but also go back and establish a plan for how to move some of the important information that was collected by third parties, right? So, um, and particularly because NOAA now houses that information, it becomes important to have the plan in place. And it, and some of them are very simple. It may be this was collected by this county and this state. We don't have much more information than that, but that's better than nothing at all. So we're, it really is important even if you don't have much to put in a plan, to have a plan and to articulate that, that it was collected. There is no um, information on these parts, but the, where we can provide information, it's here. And here's a contact at the state or the local level that was involved in it. Um, and eventually, hopefully, get that subject matter expert from the third party to, to sort of say, oh, yes, here's the information so that we have it. Um, in some cases, you're talking about 10 years back. It could be more um, and it becomes much more complicated. So that's why we're, we're trying to be as flexible as possible and just encourage as much documentation as is feasible. Don't make it up, just acknowledge when you don't have what you need. Monica? Yeah, so I, I love the question um, because I think anybody involved with a, in a project, whether contractor, cooperative institute employee, federal employee, um, should be able to contribute to a data management plan because you want the people who have the expertise who are going to be doing the work to be the ones you know filling it out and contributing to the data management plan so if that's allowed under a current contract that's fantastic um, as we go into the future you know as we mentioned before about cooperative institutes and, and grants 
you know, getting language into contracts, into those grants that not only allow for those employees to contribute to data management plans, but set that expectation that they will do so, um, I think is, is gonna be very helpful um, across NOAA. Great, thank you. Okay, Katie, back to you. Okay, so one of the panelists stated that plans can be re reused or branched off of from, um, so like a child plan. In many cases, um, we may be collecting the same kind of data that was collected in the past. So where in, they mentioned NIMS specifically, do we find them and how do we find the most relevant plan to our data? Okay, so I'm gonna say, Nori, you were identified as NIMS, so why don't you go ahead and take the first crack at that one. So a number of years back, uh, Office of Science and Technology did the heavy lift to get data management plans, umbrella plans in place. Um, we are in the process of revisiting those and trying to identify whether, you know, that effort that was done way back when we did PAR 1.0 um, is sufficiently covers in terms of umbrella plans. Um, so these plans do sit, I think, in a Google Drive, um, and we're trying to figure out how to make things available through an application so you're not just looking at static documents. Um, we're not there yet, but it is part of the effort that the Data Governance Committee within Fisheries is trying to look at. And, and so if you have specific if you have a specific question, you can always just email me and I will see how quickly we can turn around a plan that seems to be the appropriate umbrella plan um, until we can make it more searchable. It's Does anybody want to add to that? A lot of people. All right, so let's go with Jen. Yeah, thanks. I'll just, I'll add a little bit to that in that, um, what Nori is talking about, it, it does indeed work. It's maybe not as um, dynamic as we'd like it to be, but with Uncrewed Systems being a cross line office uh, distributed operation capability, every line office uses them. OMAO is involved in deploying them. We're, we are all party to that. Um, when we were looking for uh, data management plans to support several of the, the current R to O activities, uh, we were able to identify. Um, holistic and relevant data management plans to cover a lot of the uh, new incoming uncrewed systems data that, that's being researched. So it's just a matter of finding the right person to help you um, to get there. Again, reach out to your ACDOs. I mean, that's always the best first line. And if you have uncrewed systems issues, then you've got you know, Brian Cole's office, Ken Vieira and, and myself uh, can help tie, tie some of those threads together as well. And we can reach into your your ACDOs and, and data community. And I saw another hand go up. Was somebody else want? Megan, go ahead. I just wanted to add that we are looking at tools to reduce the burden of everything from metadata to data management plan. And so we have some pilots going on. We're reevaluating some existing tools. And so we are looking for ways to make it easier. If you have suggestions, please reach out. If you have proposed pilot projects, please reach out. If you want to help us evaluate existing tools, please reach out. Um, again, it's a one NOAA work in progress, but we are looking at these things to try and simplify the, the workload down the road. Great, thank you. Katie, do we have any more questions? We do have some more. So uh, next question is for grantees that want to publish their data with NCEI to obtain a DOI, for instance, in accordance with the data management plan, would they incur a cost? Um, well, the, the short answer is probably not. <laughs> um, the, the longer answer is that so to get a DOI, um, you need to archive the data that's associated with the publication. Um, typically, those are probably small data sets, uh, you know, kind of a, well, we call them one-off data sets, but a data set that you're not going to be continuously updating, basically. And, and if that's the case, it's relatively small, uh, you know, like under, I think it's 20 gigabytes, um, you can definitely use our Send to NCI uh, portal. And you just go on there, fill out the information, submit your data, and then we process it. And, and there's no charge there at all. Um, 
So if your data is larger or you need to continuously update the archive copy, then come have a conversation. Um, yeah, and, and there it depends. Um, it, it varies a little bit. Um, but if it's small, which is typically the data supporting publications, I'd um, highly suggest looking into send to NCEI. And that send to NCEI will provide a DOI for them to use, correct? You can request a DOI. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, we do have a question and it is directed to you, Fiona, and it is coming back to that idea of engaging uh, users. So how does NOAA plan to increase engagement with non-scientist data users? It's, you guys provided great information for researchers and the science community. Can we talk, can we hear more about management and transition of data for other stakeholders? Um, well, first of all, um, ORTA is focused on transition planning and um, we leave the data planning up to NCEI. We uh, follow their guidance. But with regards to um, development of transition plans, um, we always ask the PIs to engage with their end user. And um, so that end user would be not necessarily a principal investigator, it could be an operator, it could be um, uh, anybody else like that. As you know, um, the Technology Partnerships Office also falls under ORTA. And um, through that office, they develop CRADIS um, in partnership with um, ex the, the commercial sector, essentially, and industry. We also do tech transfer, which is taking NOAA information and moving it out. And there's a lot of partnership engagement there. So um, I think that, you know, specifically for data management, we're going to head this, turn this over to NCEI or for data. And um, but for um, uh, science-based knowledge or anything else like that, it's through a transition plan to the end user. So Deep, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. And I, so I, I kind of came to NCEI from this service. Uh, side and um, kind of going back to, to what, what what was said earlier about the collective responsibility to to make sure that the data are more visible. Um, that that I, and I hate to use the it depends answer, but um, you know theoretically the work that we commission in NOAA, the, the science that we commission in NOAA, does have a hopefully a line of sight, but at least an indirect path to to a use inspired case. Right, so there is a user out there that is inspiring the research that's either generating or consuming the data that we need to uh, integrate into our holdings, uh, so to speak. So if it is um, exposure for the science itself, your, your line office or, or OAR, whoever, um, will have a comms department that, that can basically help you say, this stuff is important, you can find it here. You know, the DOIs really help streamline the technical side of that process as well. If your data are being integrated in, Jen used the example of, of the, the World Ocean Atlas um, as kind of this, this aggregator of, of many, many uh, types of information. Usually those kinds of services, the, 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 uh, the kind of value add, that's kind of built into those, those services that are, that are built on the data. And they do have kind of line of sight, whether it's um, consumption by scientific colleagues or if it's a community that NOAA uh, services directly. So it's kind of a dancing around that answer a, a little better, um, but it, it really does, um, the, the work that we do or the research that we perform um, really should have some sort of, maybe it's a bent dotted line, but a, but a line between uh, our work being commissioned and, and the actual use of the information. So we are a science-based service organization. So we serve the American public, actually American and global public, um, uh, but we develop the science too. So I want to hand it to Jen, you had your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to throw a little more paint on the canvas here as well. Um, there's another lens that you can look through on this. Um, if you see a gap, in the, the utility of the data that we currently hold, that's a commerce opportunity for anybody who's capable of tapping into that. Um, you can develop some kind of application that, that uses that and, and get that out to the, the public who would want to consume it. And that's part of the uh, development of the new blue tech economy, which is something that NOAA writ large is, is pushing for. If people can create a small business 
on the information that we provide. Go for it. And Nori? Um, to build a little bit more on application development. So within fisheries, that's the mechanism we use to provide information. Um, and we have teams that develop these web applications. Some of them are public, some of them are very targeted, um, depending on the type of data. But, you know, this is a model Weather Service also uses. Um, I'm hoping to adopt more of the Weather Service model where they put out a broad call for feedback on their new applications as they're launched into the public domain. Um, and that would be a mechanism to hear not only from our standard users, but anybody who has an interest in that particular data. And that that would be another mechanism. For some, you know, they're they're directed. We have a, a mandate to serve it a particular way. And then that's more of a conversation with the targeted user group on how to best meet their need while sticking to the, the bounds in which we are being told to operate in. For some, you know, sky is almost the limit. So that gets to what Jennifer was talking about, where the, that becomes the opportunity for some external entity to make a value add product. Um, but I would always say that's great, but we always have to figure out how to make the public's data publicly digestible. So we still have that obligation within NOAA to ensure that whatever we're doing can be explained. And that may be a phone call, but most likely as we get into AI ready, we'll, we'll find mechanisms that are more automated to provide that, that support going forward. Great. Oh, Megan, I'm Monica, go ahead. Sorry, I just... Um... That, that idea of a public service, I, th I think is a really great one, is, is that we collect and provide public data. Um, I also just wanted to build on them. I think data management is a core part of science. So, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, well, this is an additional duty that's being put on me. This is not my job. And I'm not saying it needs to be all your job, but it is really important for science, for reproducibility, as was already mentioned, and for contributing to the collective scientific understanding and knowledge. So this is not something you have to do alone. There are resources, there are data experts, you know, as have been mentioned here, you know, please reach out. Um, and it's really important that we get all, you know, and be able to capture that scientific knowledge collectively um, for, you know, for the public and for the future. Great, thanks for that point. Um, so I, I, I want to say that we've gone full circle now because I think one of the first things I said is that a lot of people put it on their thumb drive and they put it in their top drawer in their offices and nobody ever gets to see that. So I, I'm hoping that the audience has heard, one, how important the data is and two, how important a data management plan is. Um, Fiona, we have one last question I was hoping we could sneak in. Oh, okay, Let, go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, this, our, our audience member asks, uh, forgive me if you've already touched on this, but with the growing influx of data coming in for R&D projects via commercial data buy procurements, do you have any next step guidance or advice? And this is for anyone. Deke. So these are the kinds of policy, uh, kind of internal policy that, that, the, that the CDO structure is kind of built to service. So getting our heads around not just R&D, uh, procurement of information, but operational procurement of information, we're going to have, um, you know, there will, we are in the initial steps of figuring out exactly what that will look like. Um, and I will gladly hand off to the pros on, on, the, on this. I'm just gonna say that we have um, uh, probably a few seconds left because we're at time, um, but I wanna give um, people a chance to quickly respond. Um, let's see, Jen, I think I see your hand first. I'll go very fast. Commercial data by task team is being headed up by our CDO, Tony Lavoie, and we are working on intent for policy today. And there's nothing we can push out there uh, for an answer, but it is something that's being talked about. Great, thank you. Nori, did you have your hand yeah, up? Did you? I would throw out that this just became an issue this week and TPO has been a wonderful resource for helping us with data by questions. 
Great. So I'm, I'm actually going to end up closing this out now quickly and handing it over back to Katie because we are at time and I don't want to take up any more time. I saw that we had a, a few people drop off at the top of the hour, but I really want to express my sincere thanks to Deke and to all the panelists for participating in this fireside chat. It's obviously been very popular, this particular one. We had a lot of people attending. Um, we're looking forward to the next fireside chat. And I want, and we, like I said, we run these quarterly. So um, stay tuned for, for more details. And um, I hope that we can find another one to be as interesting as this topic. So Katie, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.